Today on Legalese, we have a new video in my longtime series on constitutional myths and misconceptions. And today we need to discuss the myth of the Article 5 conventions and the process of amending the Constitution by a convention of the states. Hey, greetings everybody, and welcome back once again to Legalese. As always, I am your host, Bob, and I want to thank you all so much for joining me here today. And if you happen to be new to my channel, let me especially welcome you. This is the podcast where we're going to be discussing all things constitutional law, as well as current events in other areas of law, politics, and culture. Now, I just want to remind you guys real quick, if you want to find out more about our show, you can go check out our homepage over at LegalesePodcast.com. And if you want to stay up to date whenever I put out new content, because I don't just do these videos on YouTube, I also post articles to Substack. Uh, I post to alternative platforms as well. Uh, and I, I occasionally send out uh, important updates about the show when those come. And if you want to get notifications for all of those things or just for some of those things, either way, all you have to do is head on over to LegallyShow.com where you can go subscribe to our newsletter. All right. We've got a lot to get to today, so let's just jump on in here, huh? Now, this topic really sort of fell into my lap the other day as I was watching a video by the guys over at Copper Jacket TV where they were talking about the spectacular failure of Gavin Newsom's 28th Amendment proposal. Now, this was an amendment that he was putting forward to repeal the Second Amendment. We've left ourselves defenseless. Guys, we need to make some guns. Guns? Guns only lead to trouble. Right, and when that trouble happens, we'll be ready to blow its freaking head off. And Copper Jacket's video was generally very good, but there was one part that really caught my attention. Now He needs two-thirds of the state legislatures in order to make that happen, and guess what? Nobody is going for it. Not even the other governors who run their states very similar to his. I mean, take a look at New York, where they have a majority in the legislature. Take a look at Illinois, where they have a majority in the legislature. Other states that have the ability to do what he did are still not taking it up. Now, there's several reasons for this, but one of the main reasons is they know that if they call a constitutional convention and all of the states get together, they also have the ability to put things on the agenda. That means that it wouldn't just be the 28th Amendment that ends up being voted on by all of the states. It would be every agenda that every state wanted to bring forward to that convention. So essentially, even if they were able to call this and all the states got together, it would end up being this massive hodgepodge of different states trying to put things forward. And right now... Now, the problem with his statement there is his acceptance of the runaway convention fallacy. And this is very common nowadays. You find that a vast majority of people who are aware enough of Article 5 uh, to talk about the convention of the states tend to share in this belief that this would be like an amendment free for all that couldn't be controlled and that we could... Uh, you know, conceivably go in just to get one amendment passed and come out with like a whole new constitution. Now, these people further compound this confusion, and we saw this happen right in Copper Jacket TV's video, uh, where he refers to a convention of the states as a constitutional convention. However, that is not what the amendment says. Article 5 outlines a convention to propose constitutional amendments. Now, these are two very real and entirely distinct things. And so today, we are going to be debunking the runaway convention myth by defining and distinguishing between a constitutional convention and a convention to propose constitutional amendments. We will be dis uh, discussing the precise process for calling, convening, proposing, and ratifying an Article 5 convention for constitutional amendment, and because this is legalese, and there is no topic we care more about here than educating people about the original meaning of the Constitution, no part of this discussion will be done by half measures. So as we go through this video, 
about Article 5 myths and misconceptions. This video will also be a deep dive into the founding era law in history that will give you a comprehensive understanding of the meaning and scope of Article 5 and the state application and convention process in accordance with the original understanding of the framers and ratifiers who gave our Constitution legal force. And in my next video, we will be discussing the truly intriguing history of where this particular Article 5 myth actually arises from. And I think many people will be uh, quite shocked to learn not only where that misinformation came from, but when that misinformation came from, because these objections are a surprisingly recent invention. And I do very much mean invention, because... This was no sort of innocent, accidental occurrence. This was a genuine conspiracy in the truest sense of the word uh, to deliberately inject a false narrative into the public discourse to delegitimize what is, in actuality, a significant constitutional check on the power of the federal government. And before I forget, I just want to remind everyone that, as always, all the research that I will be referencing here from the 17th century colonial charters to the Modern Law Review articles, and everything in between will all be linked on the show notes page for this episode. As always, you can find that information in the video description below. And again, as always, I do encourage everyone to look into my sources for yourselves to verify the information I am giving you and to learn more about these subjects for yourself. So, turning to the actual text of Article 5, it reads, The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments which, in either case, shall be valid to all intents and purposes. As part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states, or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress. Now, the Founders envisioned that the citizens and the states would use this constitutional amendment process to prevent federal overreach and abuse. They ratified the Bill of Rights in 1791 precisely for that reason, and by that same token, in 1795, they would ratify the 11th Amendment, which would uh, reverse uh, Chisholm v. Georgia, which was a very unpopular and overreaching Supreme Court decision. Now, the founders also recognized that federal officials might resist amendments that would tend to curb their own power. And that is why this convention procedure was designed to be done in a way that can bypass those officials. And Tench Cox, a leading advocate for the Constitution at the time, would explain this effect in a letter that he wrote. So he says it is provided. In the clearest words, the Congress shall be obliged to call a convention on the application of two-thirds of the legislatures, and all amendments proposed by such convention are to be valid when approved by a convention or legislatures of three-fourths of the states. It must therefore be evident to every candid man that two-thirds of these states can always procure a general convention for the purpose of amending the Constitution, and that three-fourths of them can introduce those amendments into the Constitution, although the President, Senate, and Federal House of Representatives should be unanimously opposed to each and all of them. Now, something that we'll uh, return to later, but it is worth at least pointing out right now, is that when Cox speaks of a general convention, what he means is a convention of all the states, rather than simply a regional gathering. Now, in adopting the convention mechanism, the founders well understood what they were doing. Conventions among the states, and even before independence, conventions among the colonies, had been a fixture of American life for over a century. The founding era record renders it quite clear that a convention for proposing amendments was to be a meeting of representatives from the state legislatures 
and that the procedure and protocols would be the same as in all prior gatherings. So let's turn to some of those Article 5 antecedents that can help us understand this. Now, the process of amendment would develop hand in hand with the emergence of written constitutions themselves that would establish popular government. Now, the charter established by William Penn in 1682 and 1683 for Pennsylvania would provide for amendment to that charter. As did eight of the state constitutions that were in effect in 1787. And of those eight, three state constitutions provided for an amendment through the legislature and the other five gave the power to a specially elected convention. Now, the Articles of Confederation provided for amendments to be proposed by Congress and ratified by the unanimous vote of all 13 state legislatures. This proved to be a major flaw in the Articles as it created an insuperable obstacle to constitutional reform. In the amendment process in the Constitution, as James Madison would explain in Federalist Number 43, was meant to establish a balance between the excesses of the constant change and inflexibility. So he said, it guards equally against the extreme facility, which would render the Constitution too mutable, and that extreme difficulty, which might perpetuate its discovered faults. And so in this final form, Article 5 creates two ways for proposing amendments to the Constitution. The first is through Congress, and the second is by way of a special convention called by the states for the purpose of propo proposing an amendment. And this is exactly what Article 5 means when it talks about convention for proposing amendment. And in either case, the proposed amendment or amendments must then be ratified by the states, either, and this is determined by Congress, either by state legislatures or by ratifying conventions in the states. Now, at the beginning of the Philadelphia Convention, where the Constitution was to be drafted, the plan they started with, known as the Virginia Plan, introduced at the start of the Constitutional Convention, called only in a general way for an amendment process that would allow but not require amendment by the National Legislature whensoever it shall seem necessary. Now, the Committee of Detail proposed a process whereby Congress would call for an amendments convention on the request of two-thirds of the state legislatures. And after further debate, the delegates passed language proposed by James Madison and seconded by Alexander Hamilton that the National Legislature would propose amendments when two-thirds of each House of Congress deem it necessary or on application of two-thirds of the state legislatures. And proposed amendments were to be ratified by three-fourths of the states in their legislatures or by state convention. And just before the end of the convention, George Mason would object that the amendment proposal would allow Congress to block as well as propose amendments, and the method was changed once again to require Congress to call a convention to propose amendments on the application of two-thirds of the states. Now, in coming to understand the historical account of how such conventions operated in the founding era, also, it actually completely crushes another constitutional myth that I have wanted to cover here for quite a long time, uh, and this is the idea that the Constitutional Convention of 1787 was a coup or a conspiracy because none of the delegates actually had the authority to create a new system of government like they did. Now, I don't have time to debunk that myth here in this video, but that if that is an episode uh, that you guys would like to see, let me know uh, down in the comment section, and if I get a good response, I will start putting that one together.
All right, we're going to look at the history of founding era conventions. Now, it is understandable why there is such uncertainty among most Americans about what precisely is meant by the phrase Convention for Proposing Amendments found in Article 5 and why political and legal commentators frequently find themselves debating the composition of such a convention and the rules that would actually govern both the application and convention process because, after all, it's true, this procedure has never actually been used. But that does not mean there is not concrete historical evidence that can elucidate the original meaning of the Amendments Clause, and in fact, there are numerous examples of how this process actually works if you know where to look. The fact is, there were numerous multi-colony and multi-state conventions held during the 18th century, of which the Constitutional Convention was only one. Now, these conventions were governed by universally accepted convention practices and protocols. And what nearly all commentators have overlooked is that the framers did not write, nor did the ratifiers adopt, Article 5 on a blank slate. They wrote and ratified against the background of a long tradition of multi-colony and multi-state conventions. During the, 20, uh, during the century before the drafting of Article 5, there had been at least 32 such gatherings, at least 21 before independence, and another 11 between 1776 and 1786. Now, these multi-government gatherings were the direct predecessors of the Convention for Proposing Amendments and formed the model upon which the Convention for Proposing Amendments was to be based. These are universally accepted protocols determined by multi-government convention procedures, and these protocols fixed the acceptable way of calling such conventions, of selecting and instructing the delegates, and adopting convention rules, and conducting convention proceedings. And the actors involved in the process, being the state legislatures and executives, as well as the Continental and Confederated Congresses, and the delegates themselves, each had recognized prerogatives and duties and were subject to recognized limits. And this history would shape the Founders' understanding of how constitutional language would be interpreted and applied. Moreover, the Constitution as a legal document must be understood in the context of the jurisprudence of the time. And in that jurisprudence, customs were a key definer of the incident powers or attributes that accompany the principle or express legal concepts and powers. Now, this concept of principles and incidents constitutes what is known as the fiduciary model of government. I've talked about this in other videos, uh, and, and actually, in fact, the fiduciary model of government is so crucial to so much of our constitutional system of government, I actually wrote an entire book about it uh, called Constitutional Sleight of Hand. And so if I may take just a second here to horn myself out before we continue, if you would like to take a deep dive into that subject, and I would highly recommend you do, you can pick up a copy for yourself over on Amazon. The link is in the video description. But getting back to Article 5, the custom by which the founding generation initiated and conducted interstate conventions tells us how an Article 5 convention should be initiated and conducted, and further, they help define the powers and prerogatives of the actors in the process. But beyond that, there is considerable affirmative evidence that the founders specifically understood these customs to define the language of Article 5. These practices enable us to recapture the constitutional meaning of terms such as application, call, and convention for proposing amendments. And the founders understood a political convention to be an assembly other than a legislature designed to undertake a prescribed governmental function. Now, the convention was a familiar and approved device that several generations of both Englishmen and Americans had resorted to many times. 
such as in 1660, a convention parliament had recalled the Stuart line in the person of Charles II to the throne of England, and again in 1689, a convention parliament had adopted the English Bill of Rights, declared the throne vacant, and invited William and Mary to fill it. Also in 1689, Americans resorted to at least four conventions in three different colonies as mechanisms to replace unpopular colonial governments, and in 719, they would hold yet another. And during the run-up to independence, conventions within particular colonies issued protests, operated as legislatures when the de jure legislature had been dissolved, and removed British officials and governed in their absence, and after independence, Conventions would write several of the state constitutions. And those state constitutions also resorted to conventions as elements of their amendment procedures. The Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776 and the Vermont Constitution of 1786 both authorized amendment conventions limited as to these subjects by a council of censors. And the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 provided for amendment by convention. And the Georgia Constitution of 1777 required the legislature to call a convention to draft constitutional amendments whose gist had been prescribed by a majority of the counties. And conventions within individual colonies or states represented the people, towns, or counties. Now, another sort of convention was a gathering of three or more American governments under protocols modeled on international diplomatic practice. These multi-government conventions were comprised of delegations from each participating government, including, on some occasions, Indian tribes. And before independence, such gatherings were, were often called congresses because congress was an established term for a gathering of sovereignties. Now, after independence, there were, these were more often called conventions, uh, one presumes to avoid confusion with the Continental and Confederated Congresses. But both before and after independence, the terms could be employed interchangeably. So let's look into some of the key convention terminology. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, convention practice included certain standard terminology, some of which appears right in Article 5. For example, the convention call was the initial invitation to meet. Most calls were issued by individual states or colonies. Some were issued by the Continental Congress or by previous conventions. Now, the usual role of a multi-state convention was a problem-solving task force, so the call necessarily specified the issue or issues to be addressed. However, the call never attempted to dictate a particular outcome or to limit the convention to answering a prescribed question affirmatively or negatively. And the call also specified the initial time and place of meeting and whether the convention resolutions would bind the participating states or serve merely as recommendations or proposals. Now, the call did not determine how the colonies or states were to select their delegates, nor did it establish convention rules or choose convention officers. And an invited government was always free to ignore a call. Now, getting back to something we touched on earlier with the Tench Cox quote, a general convention was one to which all or most colonies or states were invited, even if limited to a, sim a single subject. Now, a partial convention was one restricted to certain regions, such as, say, New England or the Middle States, and so the terms general or partial refer only to geographic area. They have nothing to do with the scope of the subject matter specified by the call. Thus, a convention for proposing amendments is a general convention, even if limited to a single subject. 
and failure to understand why a convention for proposing amendments is referred to as a general convention has led some writers to conclude that it must mean it is unlimited as to the topic. Now, each participating colony or state empowered its representatives by documents called commissions, sometimes also referred to as credentials. Although a representative could be referred to informally as a delegate, the formal title was commissioner, and each commission specified the topic of the meeting and the scope of authority granted. Now, like other agents, commissioners were expected to remain within the limits of their authority, and ultra vires acts were not legally binding. However, also, like other agents, commissioners could make non-binding recommendations to their principals. So, to put that in modern terms, a convention for proposing amendments could recommend that Congress or the states consider amendments outside the subject matter assigned to the convention, but those recommendations would be legally void, which is to say, they would not be ratifiable proposals. Now, the legal force of the Constitution's words and phrases depends, uh, at least in part, uh, and some would argue entirely, on the meaning of the words communicated to the ratifiers when they approve the document. What the words communicated included not only their strict meaning, but the attributes and incidents applied by them. Hence, the modern observer needs to, and, and I mean this, really needs to consult contemporaneous customs and usages to understand these words fully. And the phrase convention for proposing amendments denoted a general convention. Now, the founding generation had experienced four gatherings that were called general conventions. These included the Stamp Act Congress, the First Continental Congress, the Constitutional Convention, and the Philadelphia Price Convention. Now, whether those common characteristics were incorporated into the Constitution's phrase convention for proposing amendments depends on whether the convention for proposing amendments was based on its multi-government predecessors. Or to put that another way, was the amendments convention to be the same sort of entity that all prior multi-government conventions had been? Or did the framers and ratifiers contemplate that the phrase convention for proposing amendments might permit procedures and protocols that were entirely new. Well, here, the historical record on this point is nearly as clear as a historical record could ever be. The founders had indeed contemplated an amendments convention to fit the universally established model. Now, the first reason for believing this is the fact that, for one thing, there was a universally established model. The diplomatic meeting among committees commissioned by their respective governments was the only sort of multi-jurisdictional convention, either general or partial, known to the founders. And so this model was not only a universal one, but it was one that was very well ingrained. Thus, the founders were familiar with a single multi-government model and they knew no other. Nor did anything in the Constitution suggest that a convention for proposing amendments would follow any other than the universally established pattern. Now, in Federalist 43, Madison uh, includes a comment in there that would also be inconsistent with anything but this traditional model. He says, this is the observation that the Constitution in equally enables the general and state governments to originate the amendment of errors as they may be pointed out by the experience on one side or on the other. Now, of course, the only way for a state government to be equally enabled with Congress in the proposal process is if the convention is a meeting of representatives from those state governments. A mere power to apply for a convention outside state control would simply not fit Madison's criterion. And so that the states in a convention assembled were the true proposers is assumed 
in other ratification era writings as well. For example, a Federalist writing under the name Cassius would assert that the states may propose any alterations which they see fit, and that Congress shall take measures for having them carried into effect. And again, for these states to propose the convention must be their own instrumentality. And so along these lines, Samuel Jones, a supporter of the Constitution, would explain Article 5 this way. The reason why there are two modes of obtaining amendments prescribed by the Constitution, I suppose, to be this. It could not be known to the framers of the Constitution whether there was too much power given by it or too little. They therefore prescribed a mode by which Congress might procure more if, in the operation of the government, it was found necessary, and they prescribed for these states a mode of restraining the powers of the government if, upon trial, it should be found that they had given too much. So, Jones thus tells us that the procedure gives the states a mode of restraining the powers of the government. And the states do not share that mode with others. The Constitution prescribes that they have it. This can be true only if the convention is their own assembly. Now, further evidence on the point comes from the spring of 1789 when the first federal Congress had assembled and 11 of the original 13 states had ratified the Constitution. However, North Carolina and Rhode Island had not yet done so. Now, these two states, as well as Virginia and New York, were still unsatisfied with the Constitution as writ written and wanted early action on amendments, and particularly they were looking for a Bill of Rights. Now, Virginia and New York both applied for a convention to propose amendments, and the Virginia application would make the following demand. That a convention be called immediately of deputies from the several states with full power to take into consideration the defects of this constitution that have been suggested by the state conventions and report such amendments thereto as they shall find best suited to promote our common interest and secure to ourselves and our latest posterity the great and unalienable rights of mankind. Now, the language of that emphatic text reveals the assumption that an amendments convention was state-based and was similar to language that long had been used to denominate an interstate convention. And so, founding era practice informs us that Article 5 applications and calls may ask for either a plenipotentiary convention or one limited to predefined subjects. Most American multi-government gatherings had been limited to one or more subjects, and the ratification era shows affirmatively that the founders expected that most conventions for proposing amendments would be similarly limited. So this founding era practice informs us also that commissioners at an amendments convention were to operate under agency law and remain within the limits of their commissions. Neither the record of founding era conventions nor the ratification debates offer any support for the modern claim that a convention cannot be limited. The only founding era effort to insert in a convention call a prescription other than time, place, and subject matter were all abortive. For example, when Massachusetts presumed to set the voting rules while calling the Third Hartford Convention, two of the four states invited refused to even participate. And this record would suggest, therefore, that a convention call, as the Constitution uses the term, may not include legally binding terms other than time, place, and subject. However, the occasional founding era practice of making calls and applications conditional or of rescinding them suggests that Article 5 applications and calls also may be made conditional or rescinded in accordance with founding era practice, these states are free to honor or reject calls as they choose. 
all founding era conventions were deliberative bodies. History and the constitutional text inform us that a convention for proposing amendments is, like its direct predecessors, a multi-government proposing convention, and this suggests that an amendments convention is deliberative in much the same way its predecessors were. And prevailing convention practice during the founding era permitted for a few procedural variations, and uh, interestingly enough, it is precisely in these areas that the text of Article 5 does prescribe procedure. Now, specifically, during the founding era, multi-state conventions could be authorized merely to propose solutions for state approval or, less commonly, to actually resolve the issue. Now, in the latter case, each state would pledge its faith to comply with the outcome. But Article 5 clarifies that an amendments convention may only propose. At the Constitutional Convention, the framers rejected proffered language to create an amendments convention that could itself resolve. And during the founding era, a proposing convention could be plenipotentiary or it could be limited. Article 5 clarifies that neither these states nor Congress may call a plenipotentiary convention under Article 5 because that article authorizes only amendments to this Constitution and further, it prescribes only certain amendments. Additionally, during the founding era, an application for a multi-government convention could refer to either a request from a state to Congress to call or the call itself. Now, Article 5 will clarify that an application has only that former meaning. Furthermore, during the founding era, a call could come from one or more states, or it could come from Congress, or it could come from another convention. Article 5 prescribes that the call for an amendments convention comes only from Congress, but that it is mandatory when two-thirds of the states have submitted similar applications. And finally, during the founding era, one proposing convention, which is that of 1787, had attempted to specify how these states were to review its recommendations. Article 5 clarifies that an amendments convention does not have this power. And in this way, text and history fit together beautifully to guide us in the use of Article 5. So to sum up the key points that one should take away, about the meaning of a convention of the states for proposing amendments. One key finding is that a convention for proposing amendments is not a constitutional convention, nor does it enjoy wide powers, as many apologists for the federal government will often claim. It is a drafting committee, for most purposes an agent of the state legislatures and answerable to them. It may consider only items on the state-imposed agenda, and its proposals become part of the Constitution only if three-fourths of the states approve. And this explains why Article 5 is relatively short, because there was no need to repeat information that everybody already knew. It does not explain the rules of the convention because those rules were already universally understood. There had already been many conventions of the states and they had all followed much the same procedure. And so when looking at this topic, the facts are perfectly crystal clear. A convention for proposing amendments is a meeting of representatives from the 50 state legislatures. The convention is called by Congress, but that call is mandatory when two-thirds, which currently means 34, of the state legislatures pass an application demanding a convention on a particular topic or topics. In issuing the call, Congress acts as an agent of the state legislatures. Congress's power extends only to adding up the calls by topic and specifying the initial time and place of meeting. And the framers adopted the convention procedure to ensure that Congress did not have a monopoly on the amendment process. The framers saw the procedure as a way the people, 
acting through their state legislatures could respond if the federal government became dysfunctional or abusive. And it is a damn good thing they did. Just consider the history of the 27th Amendment. Now, since the repeal of Prohibition, Congress has repeatedly refused to propose any constitutional amendments limiting its own powers and prerogatives. So when reformers sought to check the lavish congressional pay raises, for example, they could get nothing through Congress. Instead, they had to secure ratification of an amendment, which was the 27th Amendment, that had actually been formally proposed all the way back in 1789. And the state commissioners then convene to discuss whether they think the amendments on the assigned topics are needed. If the commissioners conclude that the amendments are needed, they will write them and propose them to the states for ratification. Furthermore, voting at the convention is on a one-vote-per-state basis. No convention proposal becomes an amendment unless three-fourths of the states ratify. So, at this point here, we know what a convention to propose amendments actually means and how it actually functions. So the last great question here would be, how have so many people become so convinced that such a convention could be asking for trouble and that any attempt by the people to amend the Constitution would cause a so-called runaway convention that so many people are so fearful of? Well, unfortunately, as I uh, alluded to at the beginning of the show, that is another topic for another day. But never fear, because that video will be coming up in just a few days. I'm already working on it. So make sure that you are subscribed to the channel so you always get notifications about my latest episodes. And please, if you would, uh, make sure to do all of those other things, too, that help to uh, trigger Al Gore's rhythm. Uh, You know, if you like the video, hit the like button. If you dislike the video, you can hit the dislike button. Uh, If if you really dislike the video, you can hit the dislike button twice. And definitely leave me a comment with your thoughts on uh, either this episode or the general topic involved, or or really whatever. I always do really enjoy uh, getting your guys' thoughts on my videos and getting a chance to interact with you in the comment section as much as I'm able to. And then please, before we go, let me just ask, don't forget to take a moment and share the show. Just post it over to your social media, or maybe just send it to a friend or two who you think would find this information, you know, either interesting or entertaining or useful. And if you would do those things for me, I would be very, very grateful. So until next time, this has been Bob for Legalese, talking about the Article 5 Convention of the States, and of course, as always, Cartago de Lenda Est.